Um, so it's been noted, yeah, my name's Andrew, I work for Microsoft and I am a CTO in residence and that is a title which confuses a lot of people. I have been previously introduced as Microsoft CTO, which I am definitely not. Um, but CTO in residence basically means I, I work in Sydney and I get to work with a lot of startups and I get to work with them principally around their technical kind of areas and their engineering organisations. And I get to work with lots and lots of startups and get to talk with lots of CTOs and VPEs about uh, what's going on in, in their startups. And, and it doesn't really matter what kind of technical stack uh, people have. I, I sometimes describe my job as uh, getting to talk to a lot of people and kind of cocking my head to the side and going, that's not really how I do that. But it didn't, doesn't matter whether they're doing kind of artisanal VM kind of stuff still or if they're doing full disaster Kubernetes. The one problem domain that I find universally across all of these startups uh, is people management. Uh, I'm actually running a survey at the moment and asking people, uh, asking CTOs and VPs what keeps them up at night and uh, floating to the top always is people management. And we ask questions about operations and security and resilience and uh, deployment and development practice and people management jumps to the top. And so whether you're a startup or whether you're a big company, uh, most of the time the problems that you're really going to encounter are people problems. Even things that you think are technology problems are actually probably people problems. Like security, we all think it's about, you know, it, it's about technology and having the right firewalls or the right rules and to an extent that's true but in the end you can have all the firewalls you want and you have one of those misconfigured or someone not wants to take a shortcut you've got a people problem that just blew apart your security and so all of the this this kind of advice and this talk that I'm gonna give is is normally given to startups uh, but I've worked in big companies and small companies and what I have found is uh, this is kind of universally true. It just happens to maybe bite startups the hardest uh, because those people problems can have the biggest impact. But before we get into it, I want to give you some introductions about myself. So for years I've worked as a developer and I've worked uh, you know, as an individual contributor. So I had my time as that kind of young idealistic developer. Um, you know the one who kind of rails against the system a bit and kind of gets on the the nerves of management. I like to think I've matured a little bit since then. Um, you could probably ask my boss and he can answer that question. But I've worked, as I said, in big companies and in small companies. Uh, I've worked in successful startups that ended up getting acquired, uh, but I've also worked in startups that have um, not ended so well. I ended uh, ending with a, a, a meeting dropping into my calendar with the, the CTO and the, the chairman of the company who I'd never met, met before, and that was the inevitable, oh, we've run out of money, I'm sorry, discussion. But I, I've worked in all of these different kind of places, and, and somewhere along the way, I, I found myself uh, going from being an individual contributor uh, to uh, starting to lead tech for a startup. Uh, and at first, it was just me, and the product it was really early stage, and it was, then it was me and a contractor, and then suddenly, I started having a team that I was working with as well. And, and, and I found I was kind of out of my depth because I wasn't able to just code and just think about the product that we were building. Suddenly I actually had to care about the people who were building this product with me. And so I had to ask myself, was I going to become this guy? Was I going to become, if you haven't seen The Office Space, go, this is, this is your homework for this weekend, go and watch the film. It is timeless. Um, Although one thing about the office space is I watch this film and they're railing against cubicles and you know what, some days in the open plan offices I long for a cubicle. But I wasn't equipped and so I was worried about becoming this guy because I hadn't, didn't have anything from, from years of, of self-teaching or any formal education uh, in, in my tool belt for managing these people. And I suspect it's probably not a new story to a lot of you in this room. Uh, maybe not in a startup, maybe not kind of finding yourself suddenly leading this, this engineering organization all of a sudden, but maybe you got promoted inside a corporate, or maybe you started a new role and moved across into some sort of management role. And so there's this idea, and this has been around since the 60s, uh, it's the Peter Principle. And it and it's came in the 60s, and basically it says that people are promoted to their level of their incompetence. 
Um, and this is especially the true when you have engineering, and the only way you can, and you can level up at a certain point in engineering is you go into management. Um, and I have issues with that particular pathway, and I'm really glad that we're now reaching a point where uh, management and individual contributors tracks of engineering are seen as separate disciplines, and they have separate career ladders, and they should do. Um, but there was a study, actually, that was released last year which, which empirically proved the Peter problem in a particular organization. And it, it showed, um, these are some really interesting graphs from the study. So it showed, a graph on the left shows that uh, the probability of promotion increases, this is a sales organization, as sales performance increases. So better salespeople uh, are more likely to get promoted into management. Uh, unfortunately, the indicators of someone being a good manager are negatively correlated with sales performance. Uh, so, the, you know, in theory, this is, this is kind of the prediction uh, that these people are going to be less good managers. And of course, it's actually borne out in practice. So they went and they managed, uh, sorry, they, they measured the marginal manager value added. Basically, how good a manager is this person? And across the different tersiles of uh, the sales performance, and it is exactly negatively correlated. So just because you are good as a salesperson or as an engineer doesn't mean you're going to be a good manager. And that is partially because we are trained around a specific set of skills uh, to, to build software. And the problem is that people don't throw stack traces. They don't have helpful error messages when things are going wrong. See, what's often going to happen is they're going to silently error and performance is going to degrade and eventually they're going to seg fault and leave. So when I found myself in this position, when I found myself as someone technical leading people, I reached out to all of the resources available to me. I, I read books, I listened to podcasts, I reached out to the former bosses who would still actually talk to me, and I got whatever advice I could. I went to conference talks. And so what I've done today is cobbled together some of the understanding I've ga gained about teams, but what I've done is actually combined it with something that's near and dear to my heart, and that's distributed systems theory. Because that's a normal thing to associate with teams. Because as technologists, we don't have a great reputation of playing well with others. Uh, often we get a free pass because we're seen as the people who write weird things into weird text editors and things happen. But I don't think it's fair for us, uh, or the people we work with, to allow, uh, allow us to ignore the dynamics of what's going on inside our team. This talk is kind of geared especially at those people who are leading teams. But I think there's relevant things for those of you who find yourselves as individual contributors within teams with no aspirations to management. I think understanding your team and understanding your team as a distributed system actually is going to be really useful in the way you work. So let's start by defining distributed systems. Let's start with some working examples. And, and probably the most typical one that I run into and, and kind of people have accidental distributed systems is uh, progressive web apps. As soon as you start having a piece of state on a server and you have some other piece of state in a browser and those start to diverge, you have suddenly have all of the ill effects of a distributed system. You just haven't acknowledged that you've got one. Now, there's some more classic examples of a distributed system. Netflix is a distributed system. This is what they call their Death Star, gra uh, Death Star diagram. Um, this is 600 odd, this is a little bit dated, but this is 600 odd microservices collaborating to give you whatever the next episode of whatever series you're currently binging on. And so Netflix is a distributed system. We can all probably get behind that. Did you know that your brain is a distributed system? Um, now, you can cut it a whole bunch of different ways, but uh, let's do the simplest one and say you have at least, at least two brains. Uh, so this red kind of complex here, um, this is called a uh, connectome, but this red thing, all these connections here, that's called the corpus callosum. That's where the two hemispheres of your brain connect. And uh, there used to be a popular surgery called a uh, corpus collo colostomy, I don't know, uh, but it's basically where they sever the corpus callosum. And that was done uh, in the hope of treating epilepsy to stop the kind of electrical storms propagating across the hemispheres. Now, it wasn't very effective at treating epilepsy, but through these surgeries, we did learn a lot about 
the brain and the two hemispheres and how they interact. And it turns out they actually have independent memories uh, and they have uh, independent functions, but they collaborate together in the, in the way of a distributed system. So maybe, those are some examples, but maybe we need a more robust definition of a distributed system. And so I'm going to borrow from Sukumar Ghosh, and in his aptly uh, named book, Distributed System, he defines distributed systems as having four main properties. And now let's compare those and let's see if we can see if a, a team might have these properties. So first is multiple processes. Now if you have a team, you hopefully have multiple people working on something. Uh, Inter-process communication. Hopefully your team, that your team members talk to one another uh, and hopefully they're collaborating together and, and, and interacting. Disjoint address space. That means each thing that is collaborating, and in our case it's a person, has a different understanding of the world, of, of the current state of the product, of the current state of the world. And so, like your brain has two distinct sets of memory, each person has a distinct understanding of what's going on. And the collective goal. Now hopefully, hopefully we're all working towards the same aim. So, are we all happy with the idea that your team could be a distributed system? Are we happy that we satisfy these four properties? Good. If you didn't agree, this would be a very short talk. So I wanted to, um, I wanted to, to kind of take these and, and instead of understanding them maybe using more properties of a distributed system, I wanted to borrow from uh, Sun Microsystems and some of the work that was done there and they came up with the eight fallacies of a distributed system. What can we understand about our teams uh, from the things that we assume about distributed systems and, and by proxy assume about teams and, and maybe learn the thing, some of the things that we assume that aren't necessarily true? Um, and so the first uh, fallacy that's listed in, in the eight fallacies as they're classically described is that the network is reliable. On a network, you cannot assume that every message sent is going to be received uh, or even received within a reasonable time frame. And similarly with people, not everything you say to someone else is going to be heard. Not every email that you send is going to be read. Not every instant message you send on Slack or Teams or whatever is going to get past that little blinking notification thing. There's a lot of them and things get missed. And even with the best of teams, our communication is never going to be 100%. And that's especially true when I talk to startups, because if they're scaling up and things are kind of blowing up, um, somewhere in the chaos, things get lost, things get missed. And so when we understand that this is a fallacy that we sometimes assume, we assume, assume that everything we say has been heard, we assume every email has been read. Um, if we break this down and we go, how do we take this understanding that the network is not reliable and, and, and architect our distributed system, architect our team to handle that, sometimes we need to choose the right mediums for the right messages. Or sometimes we need to choose the right protocols. Maybe we need to t decide to be a little bit more TCP rather than UDP in our communications. We need to do that SYNAC back and forth, make sure that you've received the message. It is overly chatty, it has some overhead, but it might be the, the trade-off that you need to make so that you know that you've been heard. Now the second fallacy is that latency is zero. If you've ever had to wait for a reply to an email or maybe sitting watching kind of message read uh, on, on an instant message um, or you've just waited for someone to complete a task so that you can move on, you've experienced this n working latency that we have within Teams. And now sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes it's fine. Sometimes we can just keep on chug, uh, chugging on. But sometimes it means that you get blocked. Sometimes it means that conflicting work gets done on divergent streams because of latency. And so it's our responsibility as we work within teams and as we, le as we lead teams to manage this latency in our distributed system. So we have to design things so that the impact of latency is mitigated. We can't eliminate latency, we just have to mitigate its impact. We have to have ways of raising up an exception if people end up in a deadlocked state. Or 
if some divergent work has happened, we need to be able to work out how to re-merge that to back together into the main work stream. Now, the third, fallacy, whoop, the third fallacy is that the bandwidth is infinite. Now, we can sometimes think about bandwidth as we can only get so much done at once. And that's true, but that's not really what we're talking about here. That's processing capacity, and that's a whole different discussion in and of itself. But we're talking about no matter how hard I try, I am never going to be able to convey all of the ideas that are in my head to you. All the, and, and all of the nuance and all of the kind of background that is in my head, I am never going to be able to convey all of it to you. We are not yet at the point of kind of Vulcan mind melds. Um, so we're, we're stuck with speaking. And, and the thing is that the impact of this is compounded as we switch mediums. So if I have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you, there is the greatest likelihood um, of all the mediums that we have available to us that I'm going to be able to convey as much information as possible and as much context as possible. But say uh, we have a video call. Uh, now, because of the, the nature of that medium, because of uh, distractions and, you know, I don't know how... I, I guess the Internet's a lot better here, but in Australia we have issues with our Internet, and so sometimes it's a bit glitchy, and so things get lost, and sometimes there's audio artefacts which distract us. And so we lose some of the, the kind of communication, so, and maybe we lose video altogether. And so then we're down to just voice, a phone call, and you've lost any facial expressions, any gestures, and even less information has passed through. And if you do a text or an email, you, suddenly you've just got words on a page, and, e and, and the amount of information which is conveyed is even less. And so more becomes inferred. More is up to the reader or the recipient to, to kind of piece back together. And, and so that can be problematic. And so when we architect our teams, we have to understand the implications of the mediums that we're using and the, the compressed bandwidth that we have available to us when we communicate. And we need to, to make choices uh, and sometimes trading maybe the convenience of a text and saying, actually, no, we need to upgrade our bandwidth and choose a higher bandwidth method, even though it might be less convenient or, or take more time, it's actually going to pay off because we're going to have better clarity and hopefully be able to move forward faster because of that. Now, the fourth, uh, the fourth fallacy is classically that the network is secure. But for the, for the case of argument, what I'd like to do is assume that everyone on your team uh, is working with the best of intentions. Uh, now, you can't always assume that. Um, sometimes that's not true. But it needs to be a base assumption that you work from. Um, and, and we'll get into that a little bit. So I've twiddled with this one a little bit. Because what we can't assume is that just like the uh, network is unreliable uh, in terms of actually receiving a message, that message can get garbled in the process. Uh, we can't assume that uh, the person who is listening to me has actually heard what I intended to say. Uh, and just the same, we can't assume that what we, are, what we are hearing and interpreting is actually what someone else has intended to say. And so that means two things, and there's two kind of key impacts that we need to have. We need to truly rely on the assumption that the person who is talking to us has the best intentions, that they are working, uh, they're, they're trying their best. Because otherwise, when we miscommunicate, and I can guarantee you, you will miscommunicate, Things are going to get messy because you, if you don't assume that some, start with a base assumption that someone is trying their best and that there is some kind of miscommunication, that is going to set you up so much better for success than assuming that someone is wrong or uh, that they're stupid. Please don't assume, don't assume that someone's stupid. Assume that they have less, potentially less context or that they've miscommunicated. There's a much better base assumption to work into, inside your team. The second thing that you need to do is you need to uh, do a little bit of perhaps hashing. You need to work out that not only has your message been received, but it has been received intact. So maybe you need to uh, do a little bit of uh, active listening so that the person relays to you what they think they've heard. And when someone speaks to you, you relay to them what you think they've said. And so that you come together and actually, again, this has costs. This takes time, but it's worthwhile. Just the, way, the same way we do, we use you know, HMAC signatures or we use uh, other, other methods to verify that 
we've actually received the message that we th has been intended for us, uh, we need to do that in our teams. Now, the fifth fallacy is that the topology of your system doesn't change. Now, as your company grows, uh, the structures are necessarily going to change. As you have different work to do, structures necessarily change. And, and the structure that fits one particular problem or maybe a team size isn't going to work with a different problem or a different team size. I mean, the differences, the fundamental differences between a team of five, a team of 15, a team of 50, the structures required to manage that are fundamentally different. And they need to evolve as the team evolves. And so we need to be aware of this. And we need to be intentional about the way we, we scale and, and the way we change. Suddenly, you know, middle, middle management might be required. And you need to scale out into different teams as, as the work looks different. Now this has an implication which brings us to our sixth fallacy, is that there, the idea that there is one administrator can no longer hold true. Because as you scale your topology, you're gonna find that there's no longer a single owner of, of a particular piece of work or a particular functionality because there's multiple stakeholders that need to be managed. And, and consensus building is gonna be required to move forward. But the thing that we know from distributed system is that consensus algorithms are hard. There was, um, over in, in, in Scott's talk just before, he asked the room if anyone understood raft protocols for, for consensus. And uh, there weren't very many hands in the room, and I don't think often we understand them in a human context either. And a lot of our roles uh, as leaders, if we're leading teams, is not so much about making the decisions ourselves, because there can't just be one administrator. There has to be multiple. Our role actually becomes comes about bringing people together so that they can make a decision together. Now, all of this has overheads. And so the, the fallacy, the next fallacy is that transport cost is zero. Communication has costs. It doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile, but you need to acknowledge it and you need to work with that. It should influence the way that we structure our teams. We should set people up in groups optimized not only for limiting communication overhead, but also just having enough people to get the job done. And so there's a classic mathematics problem that, that kind of exposes this. Uh, it's called the handshake problem. So if we wanted to work out how many handshakes would need to happen for every person in this room to shake hands with every other person in this room, um, you, it, there's, there's a simple kind of formula to do, but it, it kind of helps expose this problem. So for two people, there's one handshake required. Super easy. For three people, three handshakes. Uh, four people, that's six handshakes. For 10 people, that's 45 handshakes. Now, if we had 100 people in this room, that would require 4,950 handshakes for everyone to shake hands with every other person in the room. And so it gets out of hand pretty quickly because it's, uh, it's an exponential growth curve. And the communication is worthwhile, but it has its impact. So that's why we look at things like two pizza teams and limiting the number of people who need to collaborate to get a single thing done, because otherwise, to build that consensus, to bring everyone on the same page, is going to require a lot of handshakes and a lot of communication overhead to actually move forwards. Now, the final fallacy uh, is that the network is homogenous, that everyone's the same. And, and especially in, in startups or if you've, if you've, kept, you've brought together a new team in a, in a corporate, then initially the people involved tend to be quite similar. They tend to be quite um, mission-driven and deeply engaged with the problem. But as you grow, people are going to be motivated by different things. There's going to be different reasons they're working on a particular problem or that they're, they're working for you at all. And they're going to have different ideas. They're going to have different desires. And, and the reasons for them being there are fundamentally going to be different. And you know what? They should have different backgrounds. They should have different perspectives. They should come from different communities. And this should be treated as a feature and not a bug. See, according to research, a team with a more diverse makeup, coming from different backgrounds with different experiences, actually has a higher cumulative IQ than a homogenous one. But of course, these differences are going to complicate your communication. Sometimes people are going to be talking different protocols, different dialects, different versions. It's going to lead to misunderstandings, and, and people are going to mess up. It's worth it, though, 
but it needs to be managed to make it work well. And, and especially, this is the advice I give to startups, is getting it right early makes it so much easier to scale. Starting early with different people from different, uh, different backgrounds, different opinions, different ideas, uh, having a heterogeneous team makes scaling that uh, cumulative IQ much easier. Trying to do it post hoc is really difficult. Now we've got, gone through the fallacies and, and there's one thing that I really got stuck into when I got started with distributed systems theory, um, especially because I was actually looking at the, the Dynamo theorem in particular, and I looked at uh, CAP theorem. Now CAP theorem can get pretty hairy pretty quickly, uh, and so I'm just going to do like the Cliff's Notes version. Um, but basically it's one of those classic triangles where you get to pick two. And in our case, uh, the three things that we get to, to pick from are consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Now, of course, in an actual distributed system, uh, you want it to be resilient, so not choosing partition tolerance is a non-starter. So you can't have a single point of, fail of single point of failure. It's not an option. A resilient distributed system has to be partition tolerant, and that means that the loss of any node or any network uh, operation can't stop the system from functioning. However, more often than we'd like to admit, we often architect our teams to have a single point of failure built into it. Uh, now, it might be a CTO or a VPE in a startup, or it might be uh, a principal engineer in a, in a corporate, or, or maybe you're a rock star developer. If you're re relying on a rock star developer, what you're doing is you're building a monolith. Don't build a monolith. It's not going to scale with you over the long term. And we're in this for the long term, right? The other way I, I kind of describe this is I say that rock stars don't scale. What they do do is they create a single point of failure in your organization, and ultimately they create a drag on your team as a whole. The trick with rock star developers is to transition them from being a rock star to being a team player. Um, I like to describe it in, in, in musical terms, since we're already in the neighborhood, as like going from the, the, the guy who uh, you know, plays the, the wailing lead guitar solos in the ballad uh, through to like a, a jazz musician. Someone who's truly part of the team and playing off one another and, and kind of supporting those around them. And the problem is that's not an easy path uh, because we humans are, are often ego-driven creatures. And, and helping someone transition from something, that, some, from that kind of deified hero position to someone who is a true team player is, is tricky. And it's not always going to work. Um, but if you want to be able to scale your team and if you want to be able to, to grow and move forward as a, you know, in, this, in this world, uh, you need to break up your monolith. So if, if, we, if partition tolerance is a, is, is a, is a must-have, then we have two kind of things that we, we can trade off against each other. We're, in CAP theorem, they're described as CP and AP systems, consistent and available. Um, you either prioritize consistency or availability. Now, this is kind of a false dichotomy. It's, it's not necessarily a one or the other kind of binary choice. Uh, you don't have to choose uh, just to, to be consistent or just to be available. It's about making the right trade-offs in the right places. And that was the really interesting thing about Dynamo theorem, is uh, uh, being able to kind of make some choices about how you form quorums and how you, you move forwards. And, and maybe in parts of your team, you actually want to prioritize availability. You always want to be able to move forwards. Uh, even if you might develop a little bit of inconsistency along the way, so long as you kind of are regularly resolving any conflicts, uh, that can be a positive way to work. Now, in other parts of your organization, maybe especially those externally facing parts of the organization, uh, consistency might be essential. And so you might not, rather not move forward until you have consensus, and until you have everyone on the same page. So it's about trading those off. And so we have a service um, in Azure, and this is the one kind of product plug that I'm going to give in my entire talk. Uh, we have a service in Azure called Cosmos DB, and I love this service because it is super cool. Uh, just from like an engineering nerd point of view, 
Uh, it's a globally distributed, globally replicated document database. Um, and it's the embodiment of this distributed systems kind of idea. And it embodies the trade-offs as well, because you can decide. There's literally a slider in the, in the, um, in the portal where you can decide uh, that you want strong consistency. You want strong consistency guarantees about the data that you have all over the, the globe. And so that means that you have limitations in terms of your throughput, and you have limitations in terms of your latency, and your costs go up, but you know you have strongly consistent data. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, at the other end of the scale, you can drag that slider and say, I would like eventual consistency. I would like YOLO consistency, but that gives you really fast uh, response times, low latency. Uh, you have reduced your costs. Um, and you have high throughput, and that's fantastic. But of course, you have your low consistency. And it will eventually work itself out. Um, and that might be sufficient for your needs. But what we have to, the, the great thing about that is there's some points on the scale in between those two far reaching edges. And so you can choose to tune your level of consistency and, and, uh, and availability across and decide where you want it. And we get to do the same things with our teams. We get to choose and, and tune those trade-offs. We get to decide what's important and communicate that to our teams and, and to kind of step forward and, and, and work out those priorities with those involved. So given all of that, so we've gone through a whole bunch of distributed systems theory. How do we actually scale our teams? What are the practical things that we can do uh, to, to actually be able to take these, these teams from from you know, zero to hero, as it were. Now, like, like distributed systems, there's some pretty basic things that we can do uh, that we're going we're gonna to need if we want to scale these things well. And the first of those things is monitoring. We want to monitor our teams. We need to identify fault conditions as and when they happen. And that requires us to, uh, to have our finger on the pulse. And um, you need to ask questions of your team. And you need to ask questions of yourself as well. Are you making the right trade-offs? Because basically, when we went through those eight fallacies and through CAP theorem, basically it nails down to trade-offs. And you've got to ask yourself and ask your team, are you making the right ones? Do your team know where they're going? Can they articulate the how, well, sorry, the what, the how, and the why? of what they're doing. And this is where one-on-one -on -one meetings become really powerful. Uh, they become essential because they allow you to talk to your team members and talk about issues that they might be encountering, talking about issues they might foresee, um, and to, to kind of understand what's going on in, in the nitty-gritty, in the components of your distributed system. But as you grow, the cadence of these one-on-ones these -on is going to change. And they might actually not be you doing all of the one-on-ones, but it might be team leads and, and that kind of thing. But it, it's going to be important to bubble up that information and coalesce it to a whole system understanding of what's going on in your team. The current buzzword in distributed systems is observability. And the same is true of teams. Uh, whether it's doing, uh, we, we work with some startups that help do like lightning quick kind of 30-second surveys that go on a really regular pulse to understand what's going on inside a team, or whether it's doing uh, intensive uh, kind of performance management and one-on-one -on -one, uh, type things. That's, uh, that, again, is up to you of how you want to dial that up. But doing something so you understand what's going on inside your system is essential. And one thing that I really want to articulate with uh, the one-on-ones the -on is they should be times, and they should be times which are set aside and dedicated and kept. Even if there are no issues to discuss at that particular time, having a dedicated time that, you're, uh, that the people know that they can air issues with you, and they have a, a, um, the psychological safety to do that, is going to mean that things do come to you uh, when there's problems. They don't just sit and kind of uh, bubble under the surface. Speaking of issues, like in any distributed system, we are going to need to deal with conflicts. Because inconsistent state is inevitable. We have one of the, the kind of fundamental things that we have as a distributed system is disjoint address space. We have separated memory. We have, have separated understandings of the world. And um, unfortunately, like in reality, we can't actually do this strong consistency slider. 
Like we don't have the same ability to, to have the same consensus algorithms as we do with our distributed systems. So we're going to have conflict because people come from different backgrounds. Uh, they have different perspectives. They have uh, different experiences, different opinions. All of those things we talked about in that eighth, eighth, eighth fallacy. And so they're going to come at things from different directions. And that means you're going to need to manage the conflicts. We need to get people back on the same page when things kind of get weird. And we can't be afraid of conflict. I think um, often as engineers coming into management, we can be very conflict averse and kind of run away from it. But if we run away from it, if we bury conflict, we might take, um, I, I kind of think of it like divergent Git branches. If you kind of bring that merge in nice and early, that's, that can be pretty trivial. But if you let those two branches diverge for long enough, you have that pathological merge which you are going to spend days or weeks or months trying to bring back into the main line. And so you need to deal with that conflict. And a lot of that, again, is about this idea of psychological safety. You need to make it OK to be wrong. You need to model being OK with being wrong. You need to set as a priority getting there together being more important than being right. More important than being the smartest person in the room, which again is going to be tricky for your rock stars. And you as a leader, if, if you're a leader, you're ultimately responsible for, for your team getting there. Um, and that means being able to facilitate bringing people back together. And that requires psychological safety, which is a hard thing to develop. Now, in order to scale and in order to move forward, uh, we, we need people to be able to make good decisions independently. And to make good decisions independently, we need context. And so that requires us to communicate and to communicate as much as possible, to be transparent about what's going on and why we're doing a particular thing. And that's going to help people stay on the same page. And it's going to help people be able to intuit what they should be doing. And it's going to reduce some of that communications overhead on you. But communication, as we've said, has costs. It's going to take your time and it's going to take your energy. And sometimes it's going to feel unnatural being transparent and being vulnerable, perhaps, rather than attempting to act in the kind of command control, top-down way of working, but it is going to be a more efficient distributed system if you engage in that way of communication. It's going to pay off. Now, I have two communication slides in this deck. That's redundant, and that's the point. Sometimes you can feel like you're repeating yourself, but as we've said, people miss things. Things go unheard and things go misunderstood. And so it is better for you to over-communicate than under-communicate. And I'll tell you what, in all of the places I've worked, in all of the startups that I've interacted with, I have very, very, very rarely seen anyone manage to over-communicate. If you have something that you really want your team to hear, and you feel like you've said it too many times, I have this suggestion for you. Say it one more time, just in case. So I'm going to say this one more time, just in case. Explain the what, the how, but most importantly, the why to your team. And within reason, I would encourage you to uh, be transparent about what is concerning you, what anxieties you might have about a particular strategy. And, and also to be talking about the things that are driving you, whether those are pull factors or push factors. But giving your team that context is really important. And you can use things like OKRs and, and that kind of thing to kind of make sure your team is on track. But my advice to you is always come back and pop back up to the why. Now, have you ever found yourself um, in this kind of situation? Uh, a, a while ago, I was in the kitchen. Um, with, with my family, we were celebrating uh, Mother's Day or my mum's birthday or something, and so we were all in the kitchen and we were preparing some food. And so I was there, I was chopping some vegetables, and uh, 
someone else was uh, preparing the roast, someone else was making a salad, and someone was cleaning, uh, doing some dishes. And so everyone was working together, I guess, but separately. And so kind of very much this archetypal kind of distributed system team kind of thing going on. Um, and so I finished cutting the carrots. And I looked around, and suddenly I found myself in the position where uh, people were const constantly running into me. I was in the way. And, and I thought, moments ago, we had been fine. We had been this well-oiled machine working together to prepare this dinner. And then at this moment, I was in the way. And, and I couldn't work out what had changed. See, what had changed is I had completed my thing, and then my role in the kitchen had become unclear, not only to me, but also to all of those people around me. Because it turns out that we map out our actions in relation to what we understand other people's goals to be. So we anticipate other people's movements and we anticipate other people's actions and we adapt to that. Now if we don't understand what someone else's goal is, we can't anticipate their actions effectively. And we don't, if we don't know what they're trying to do, we don't know how to negotiate our, our way around them and optimize our path. Now the same thing happens in a team. Not only do I need to understand what I am doing as an individual, and that's important, I need to know my goals, but in order to be successful, I need to understand what the people around me are doing and what their goals are. Otherwise, what, what's going to happen is we're going to tri trip each other up. And simultaneously, if it's not clear who is leading a particular effort or who is uh, responsible for a particular thing, that ambiguity can also lead to conflict. And so we need to make sure that it's clear, if there is someone who is responsible for a thing, that that is articulated well to the team. Now, just as important as individual goals, there are collective goals. Goals for your whole team or sub-teams or anything that you have within that, and it's key to reiterate those goals. Again, including any reasoning behind those goals. And, and my recommendation of when you should do this is at every possible opportunity. It's important because, especially as technical teams, we can get bogged down in the minutia, in the detail, in the tiny pieces. And so we need to pop up the stack and go back to the, the, the big goals and the big why of why we're doing this. Because it's, it's really easy to get eyes down. And as leaders, we need to be responsible for that, uh, for our team, to pop their eyes up above, uh, above the horizon and see where we're going as a company as a whole. What it all comes down to is that the thing that's going to set up your team to succeed uh, is culture. Now, I love this, this Peter Drucker quote, that, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Because uh, it doesn't really matter uh, whether you're doing the, the Spotify model or whether you've got two pizza teams or whatever else is hip, whether you're doing mob programming. Uh, the thing that is going to be the driving force towards your success is going to be culture. Because culture is bigger than strategy. Culture is going to make or break your strategy because in the end, if things go big, they're going to scale beyond your individual control. And people are going to have to make decisions and have interactions that are unmediated by you. And so the things that's going to mediate them, the thing that's going to guide them is the culture that you've established. The best way I found to, to describe culture is the collective character of a group. Although there's a really good definition actually on the, on the wall back there that says the culture of an organization is shaped by the, the worst behavior a leader is willing to tolerate. I also really like that. So that's a, that's a, that's a good one I, I'm going to add to my quiver. But our character, it, it seeps out through every pore of our, our, our body as a human. Like you, you can understand my character from being around me and seeing the actions that I take. And just like we can work on our character as an individual, we can work on our culture as a group. But our character underlies our action, and our culture as a company also underlies our actions. And so when it comes down to it, our culture is not built by having a culture and values sessions or a spiffy slide deck. You know, Enron had a, a culture and values slide deck. It was really nice. They had really nice values like uh, integrity, and then uh, Enron tended up turned out not to be, have a lot of integrity um, when things unraveled. 
Culture and value sessions and slide decks and nice quotes on a wall can be, um, can be useful to articulate some of the ideas, but in the end, culture is driven, culture is built through the decisions we make. Um, I was chatting, actually, when I was building the first iteration of this talk uh, with a friend of ours called uh, Jenny Herald, and she articulated it this really fantastic way. And she said that our culture is defined by who we hire, who we fire, and the behaviors that we reward and the behaviors that we reprimand. It's about the choices that we make. And so my advice to you, if you're growing your teams, is kind of twofold. Build a culture that welcomes a diverse set of people and aligns them together and sets them up to thrive. Make choices that might be hard at the time, but that are going to pay off over the long term in terms of culture. And then secondly, communicate where you're going, how you're getting there, and most importantly, why you're going there at all. There's so many parts to actually functioning within a team or, or leading a team, and there's, there's lots that I haven't said today. But I strongly believe if you get a handle on the, these two things, uh, then you're going to be long, well on your way in terms of succeeding and scaling up a successful engineering team. Thanks a lot. Are there any questions?